Good evening, everyone. I'm Lonnie Stonich. I'm the Executive Director of the Family Action Network FAN, and I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's webinar with our old fan favorite, Madeline Levine. Thanks for attending. Uh, for those of you who have just discovered FAN, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. We're a 501c3 organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public uh, on topics related to human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among many other topics. We've been fortunate to host some of the world's most esteemed researchers, clinicians, authors, educators, and activists, including folks such as Brene Brown and ta Coates, Ibram Kendi, Carol Dweck, Howard Gardner, Andrew Solomon, Adam Grant. I could keep listing lots and lots and lots of people. Um, so lots of stuff. We've been doing it for years and years and years. We have about 100 videos of past events on our website, so you can go there and explore. Uh, you can also find them on our YouTube channel, so make sure you go check them out. I have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. We are recording this webinar uh, in a few days once our um, video editor kind of does some fluffing on it. Uh, we'll be sending it out to all of you who had registered, even those who are not attending. Um, we will post the video on our website and our YouTube channel, and it's for free public viewing. So once those are hosted, feel free to uh, spread them far and wide. Um, all attendees are currently muted and off camera. Uh, the chat is uh, open, but it is read only. So we'll be populating it with um, some various, um, you know, things that we want you to know, links for things that Madeline might be mentioning, um, reminders about different things. So we'll be populating the chat. There is, you can submit questions. If you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A function. You can submit questions through Q&A. And I will be, uh, I and our, our team, our production team will be going through those questions as Madeline does her, her 30 minute talk. And we'll be calling some questions from, from that to be asking her in the end. Um, so thank you also to the attendees who submitted some questions in advance. I've got all of those and I've gone through them. So I have them at the ready. Um, I want to note that Dr. Levine's books are available for purchase um, through our bookseller, The Bookstall, and I believe one of our producers will be putting some information in the chat about where to buy that. There you go. Well, there's the thing about the past events. Uh, she'll put that in there in just a second. I want to say a special thank you to the 31 schools and organizations that are sponsoring tonight's event. Um, we will be pasting a list of those folks as well in the chat, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and a big special thanks to all fan donors whose financial support keeps all fan programming free and open to the public. Um, we are going to be launching a very quick poll, uh, one question poll right now as a part of housekeeping. We're trying to determine um, when we're looking at attendance for our events, you can see this here, we're trying to figure out, um, we get a number about how many devices are tuned in, but that's a little bit different than how many people are actually viewing. So we know that some people uh, might be in a room with two people or three people, including themselves. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute and just giving us a quick head count, we would really much, very much appreciate it. I'll let that go for a couple more minutes and then we'll pull it down. Um, let me just let it go for uh, maybe just a couple more seconds, then we'll turn it off. So if you wouldn't mind jumping in and then we'll turn it off. Uh, I'm assuming one of, um, I'll, I'll end the poll. I'll let the producer know I'll end the poll and I'm gonna do that now. All right, so now I'm gonna jump in here for an introduction to Dr. Levine. Uh, Madeline, uh, I guess, uh, I guess we'll, sh I don't think I need to share results. We'll skip the sharing results part. We're just all still figuring out all this Zoom stuff. So if it seems like, why don't they know what they're doing? We don't quite know what we're doing, <laughs> but we are gonna make it up as we go along. Uh, Madeline Levine. Is also an old friend uh, and a psychologist with close to 40 years of experience as a clinician, consultant, educator, and author. Her New York, New, York, yeah, New York Times bestseller, The Price of Privilege, explores the reason why teenagers from affluent families are experiencing epidemic rates of emotional problems. Her follow up book, Teach Your Children Well, also a New York Times bestseller, tackles a narrow definition of success how it unnecessarily stresses academically talented kids and marginalizes many more whose talents and interests are less amenable to measurement. Her current book, Ready or Not, focuses on how to best prepare children and ourselves for an uncertain and rapidly changing world. This is Dr. Levine's fourth appearance for FAN. I did all the research on that. The first was in March of 2011, a joint appearance with Professor Denise Pope titled Walking the Talk, Aligning Actions and Values for Youth Well-Being. Professor Pope is a co-founder with Dr. Levine of Challenge Success, a research and intervention project based at Stanford University School of Education. 
that aims to reduce unhealthy pressure in youth and champions a broader vision of youth success. Madeline's second visit was in November of 2012 for a three-person panel titled, One Size Does Not Fit All. <laughs> That's so cute looking at those old flyers. On, <laughs> on stage with Dr. Levine was another longtime fan favorite, Dr. Ken Ginsberg, who is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and the author of several books. I think you're gonna probably hear about them a little bit later on, uh, including my personal favorite, Building Resilience in Children and Teens. Uh, Professor Pope was the third panelist that night. Uh, Madeline then returned, she's coming back, uh, to March of 20, uh, in March of 2016 for a solo talk titled Moving the Needle, Parents, Teens, and Resilience. At that time, she had just started work on what is now her latest book, Ready or Not, which was released this past February. Dr. Levine has been had been scheduled for a fan event for March 10th of this year, and she was the first of 14 speakers that were canceled this spring due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So we're glad we were able to reschedule. So it is my true personal and professional pleasure to present to you Dr. Madeline Levine. Thank you, Lonnie. Uh, you, you're, um, you don't give yourself the huge amount of credit that FAN deserves. There is no other organization in this country and I've spoken all over that does the job that you do. The people you have brought, you could have gone on and on, left out Brian Stevenson and Patty Smith, my two, my two favorites, but in any event, um, I'm so happy to be speaking, I assume largely to Chicago, although not exclusively. Um, I'm sorry to be on video a little bit because I love coming and having dinner with Lonnie the night before and giving a talk and getting the energy from the audience, but it is what it is. And so I think I'd like to start by talking a little bit about my new book um, and how that relates really to what's going on in the pandemic. So um, ready or not, uh, preparing our children to thrive in a rapidly, in an uncertain and rapidly changing world. I had no idea that there was going to be a pandemic, but um, there was. and the book is really about two things. One is how we best prepare children in a world that's rapidly changing, which is exactly what we have right now. But the other, the other reason I got interested in this book was um, something really Lonnie mentioned, which is myself, Wendy Mogul, Ken Ginsberg, um, Michael Thompson, KJ D'Antonia. I mean, all of us have been schlepping around the country for a good decade with ideas about lowering stress for kids because in that period of time, anxiety disorders, depression, cutting, substance abuse, were all going up. And um, we felt strongly, and that's how Challenge Success got started, that the amount of pressure that was on kids was uh, feeding the anxiety epidemic, and it was considered an epidemic, and it is considered an epidemic. One out of three children and teenagers and adults in America now meet the criteria for a clinical anxiety disorder. And you'll get different numbers on that. It really doesn't matter if it's one in three or one in four. It, it depends sort of on who's doing it and what they're using for their numbers. But the point is the trajectory is going up. And, and I was curious about that. You had all these well-intentioned people with very good data. We collected great data at Stanford about how to reduce anxiety. And yet, um, in spite of the education about Harris's education on you guys are just getting too much homework or sleep education, we just weren't seeing um, a diminution of anxiety. And on the contrary, we were seeing rising rates of anxiety. So um, on a personal note, you can imagine what it's like to spend 10 years talking about the need to reduce anxiety and then look at numbers and see all it's doing is climbing upwards. Um, so that was one reason to write the book was like, what did we miss? You know, I, I was at, as Lani said, I spoke for fan four times. I was at many other places in Chicago as well. 
everybody would shake their head. Yes, kids need more sleep, less homework. But then it didn't really happen. And I'm still interested in that question, although I have a few answers for it now. Um, and the other thing that really interested me was it was clear that jobs were requiring a new skill set. Um, I have three millennial sons, they're grown up, but I could see from the way they were working at home at a gig, um, their friends were working, it was like different. And I, I had an aha moment. My husband's cousin is the head of neuroimaging at NIDA. Uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse, a part of NIMH. And he's my go-to person around science. Um, and I asked him maybe three years ago, two years ago, is there a difference in the kids you're hiring now versus the kids you hired 10, 15 years ago when I started being interested in these issues? And he said, absolutely. Um, so that was interesting. In what way are they are you hiring different kids? And he said, quote, content has gone to the bottom of the list, end quote. Now, that doesn't mean that content doesn't matter. Of course, content matters. But content alone is inadequate for the kinds of skills that are needed. Content is, you know, you have a finger in Google, you can get a lot of content. And so I asked him if it wasn't content that was at the top of the list, what was at the top of the list? And he, he rattled off what everybody um, else who I spoke to rattled off, which was uh, EQ, perseverance, creativity, collaboration, um, because there is so much information out there and accessing information is not th that hard what you do with that information, how you put that information together, um, how you work with other people when what you have, you, we're seeing this now in biotechnology where we're looking for a vaccine and there's all kinds of candidates and what works and what doesn't work is gonna be going on for a year at least. And I'm hoping some kids instead of finance maybe get interested in biotechnology or science, which has seen a dip in interest, unfortunately. But those were the two reasons. Um, and so I went around the country and I talked not to my usual suspects, not to psychologists and educators, but I talked to people who were kind of in the middle of change. Um, for example, I spent a lot of time with a guy named Sandy Winnefeld, who was the vice chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, second highest military position in the country. Military has changed radically because once they had a different kind of war, um, they couldn't use the everything from the top anymore. They had to get more horizontal. And um, there was no time. They explained stories like if they had to go to the top for permission, uh, the Taliban was gone. You had to be really quick, really nimble, and you couldn't go through a bureaucratic process. Um, I spoke at great length to uh, Gorman, uh, J James Gorman, who's the head of Morgan Stanley. That went through a lot of changes after uh, 08, 09. Um, he said something really interesting to me. It's worth thinking about. He said that um, 80, he'd like 80% of his guesses, I hate to think that my money is with somebody who's guessing, but 80% of his guesses, he's the CEO, need to be right, which means 20%, he's, he'll live with 20% being wrong. And that, that's kind of a reflection of the, it's not about content only, it's about being willing to take risk and um, live with the consequences of the fact that sometimes you'll get it right and sometimes you'll get it wrong. Anyway, I, I took all these ideas about being more nimble, being more collaborative, being more creative, and that's what went into thinking about um, what makes a child ready for a future that is changing, but it's not just the fact that it's changing. The velocity at which it's changing is what's new. So, you know, people in the beginning would say to me, well, look, you know, we had an industrial revolution and th that was big change. How is this any different? Well, it's different because the industrial revolution took place over a hundred years. 
and iPhone um, penetration into the population took about three years. So the things that are moving us along now are changing far more rapidly than we've, we've ever been um, exposed to before. And it needs somebody who is more of a risk taker, um, more nimble, and, and more willing to like iterate and reiterate and get it right, and get it wrong, pick themselves up, things like that. So that was the start of the book. Uh, I had no idea we'd have a pandemic, obviously. Um, so the, pan the lockdown in California came about two, three weeks after the book was published, uh, which was unfortunate. And I missed the opportunity of getting to go around the country and talk to people and kind of get more feedback on it. Um, but this will end at some point. And I think so many of the skills that ended up being incorporated into the book are particularly relevant now. Um, I have one other thing to say about the rising rate of anxiety before I move on to a skill set. And that's like, how come parents are so much more anxious than they've ever been? Um, the world is scary right now. I, th I th find the world very scary right now for multiple reasons on multiple levels. And, and I think people never fully bought into the idea that um, getting your kid into Harvard or Yale or whatever, uh, they never really believed that that was not necessarily an advantage. And I never want to come across like I'm saying those aren't good schools or don't send your kid. That's, that's not my point at all. Um, those are small schools that take a small number of kids and the amount of stress around college applications was just impossible. Um, challenge Success has a really nice white paper on the Challenge Success website about how much difference schools make. We do have some research on it. But parents were very anxious about this. And, and the line I heard all the time was, yes, Dr. Levine, you're right. I know my kids should sleep more. I know they don't need four APs or five APs or whatever but I can't afford to have my child be an experiment. And I think what was missing was you can't afford not to have your child be exposed to and become capable of a new set of skills, because that's really what is going to make a difference. And I think what we ended up doing, I think what we ended up doing was we ended up not protecting our kids in the way we should have. We should have insisted that the work that was done on homework that said after two and a half hours in high school, the learning curve just, you know, falls off a cliff, an hour and a half in junior high school falls off a cliff. We should have paid attention to that, but we didn't. We weren't marching, we weren't, you know, confronting the school system. But what we did look at so seriously were the kinds of things I think that kids needed to experience. And those were experiences of disappointment and challenge. I think life is very difficult for kids right now. I think they've been thrown into the deep end of the disappointment pool with very few uh, skills for managing. Um, I think I told Lonnie the story, my last speaking engagement in public, um, was in San Francisco. And I asked the audience, I was in, interested in disappointment. I asked the audience how many people, there were five, 600 people, had never had their heart broken. And out of a large audience, one person raised their hand, said she had never had their heart broken. So there's the other, you know, 549 of us who've had our heart broken. And I think, and we're there. And we survived and we grew up and we had relationships and children. And I think the point is that in order to tolerate and manage through challenge, you have to have these small experiences of challenge along the way, titrated experience of challenge. So your kid doesn't get invited to the popular party. Don't make another party for him that's cooler. Let him sit with the disappointment of it let him know you think he can handle it. You know, what I started to see in my practice were kids who were protected from challenge time and time again. So 
child is afraid to sleep alone. The parents are sleeping with him till he's seven. And then he's afraid to go to a sleepover because he's never really slept on his own. So the parents have the sleepover at their house. And then he goes to sleepaway camp and they get a call. Your son doesn't like sleeping here. There are bugs. And they come and they pick the kid. And so each by themselves, um, and, and for the sake of full disclosure, one of my kids probably slept in my bedroom till I, till I was, till he was five on the floor. Um, I was exhausted, I had three kids and working, and I don't think any one of these things matter, but when there's a persistent pattern of not allowing a child to experience the anxiety that is a natural part of growing up, you know, the, the dog scares me. Do you go around the corner or do you let the kid with your help start to walk through? And I know it's a very unpopular point of view, but my point of view about uh, trigger warnings, um, I have two sons that are lawyers now, and when they went to school, there were trigger warnings. It's the exact opposite of what you would do as a clinician. As a clinician, if somebody's fearful and traumatized and upset, you expose them slowly. So I think we, I think that is what has contributed to a level of anxiety that's incredibly high. Because look, anxiety, it, we know anxiety is about 60% of the variable of an anxiety disorder is genetic. It's an important thing to know. So those of you who feel I made my kid anxious, um, you know, it was probably there in the beginning. If 60% is genetic, what's the other 40%? It's environmental. Um, we have a, a saying we like, which is genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. And I think the environment that we had of being fearful, what will happen to you if you don't get into your first school? Um, the varsity blues scandal, what a vote of no confidence that is for a parent to say, you can't get into school on your own. I mean, so I think we had set up an environment of uh, extreme anxiety about performance. Um, I had one kid who, uh, he's an AP calculus, right? AP calculus. And his dad is so worried about his grade that the father is graphing every grade this 16 year old kid gets. And you have to wonder if he's an AP calculus, isn't he perfectly capable of graphing his own stuff? But the father was so invested in him being an outstanding math student. So he got an outstanding math student with trichotillomania, which is why I saw him, which he's pulling out his hair and he's pulling out his eyebrows. Um, the stress level was so unnecessarily severe for this kid. Um, so I think that all of those things are worrying about our kids, our own, look, if your level of anxiety is high um, and then your kid gets anxious, it's hard for you, right? Because your level of anxiety is already high. So you are more likely to attenuate or lower your child's anxiety because it makes you more comfortable. It's easier to say, okay, we won't walk past the dog, honey. I don't want you to be scared. It's the wrong thing to do, but it's easier and it lowers our anxiety as well. Um, so I think, I think the culture had become extremely anxious um, and kind of out of tune with what was happening in corporate America, in the military, in artificial intelligence in parts of the country that were moving forward and demanding a new skill set. And we were still stuck with, you know, five hours of homework and five APs. And um, what we saw was kids getting worse, getting sicker. And um, I can't implore you enough when this is over and it will be over at some point to let go of, as best you can, to let go of the notion that there is a trajectory that guarantees a degree of success. And in, in my book, Ready or Not, there's a whole chapter of arbitrary people that I met in the course of writing it who were profoundly successful, none of whom took um, 
took a straight line. They all took what I'm calling the squiggly path, including myself. Um, I went to a state school. Lonnie mentioned uh, Denise and I were there twice, I guess, together. And when we're on a stage together, it's kind of funny because she went to Stanford and Harvard, and I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, and yet we're both standing and doing the same kind of work. So there's, I think there's an overvaluation that at one point made more sense than it does now. Um, I'm in Silicon Valley or right near Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Um, they do not any longer do recruiting from only a few of our most prestigious schools. And the reason is because they're finding that's not the skill set that they want. So you need, you need to buy that on a visceral level that um, all the things that go into pushing your kid in that direction um, have some responsibility for the level of anxiety we're seeing among our kids. Okay, I'm, that's that on that. And, and one more thing, and remember, um, you know, parents will often say to me something like, well, I went to Brown, um, how could that be a problem for my kid? And it's not necessarily a problem for your kid, but it might be, it might not be the right school. And the, the things that were necessary 40 years ago is an entirely different skill set than is necessary now. So I'm gonna move on to the skill set, um, which, you know, I think I've, I've said it's about um, creativity and rapid learning and collaboration is a huge, huge one. Um, I, I think I have time to tell a story, which I always do. So I'm, I'm sitting in an office with my youngest son, um, uh, getting a mortgage, I think, and I'm talking to the head of the mortgage department at First Republic Bank. This is, you know, a real story. And um, my son is with me. He's, I think, a senior in college at that point. And he's just kind of being himself. He's the three boys. One of them is the one who's taking care of mom. You know, mom, your throat sounds like you need some coffee or tea. Can I get you some I'm afraid that the meter is gonna run out. Let me put a quarter in it, you know, just maybe two or three times over an hour and a half. And at the end of the conversation, the head of mortgage for uh, First Republic turns, you know, we finish our business and she turns to my son, who she knows nothing about, and says, I'd like to hire you. She doesn't know if he's in college, if he's gone to college, didn't go to college. And I'm like st struck, you know, I said, Tell what? <laughs> you don't know anything about him. And she said, I don't need to. He was taking good care of you. That's the kind of kid I want to sit next to at work. And so that was like a really personal um, confirmation of the fact that, in fact, this was what was being looked for. Just so you know, the tail end of that story is he worked for a bank for two years and hated banking so much that he went to law school. So you never, you know, you never know what the trajectory is going to be. But it was clear that she valued his kindness and empathy and compassion. <clears throat> so now we have a pandemic, right? And what does everything I'm talking about have to do with the pandemic? Let me take just two minutes to talk about how we talk to kids at different ages about the pandemic. Um, keep in mind, if you have young children, they're concrete, they're magical, less is more. Um, don't tell them they're not going to grandma's because grandma has asthma and she could die. Take your cue from what they want to know about and keep it simple and um, not sarcastic. Kids who are over about seven, because seven is when uh, logical thinking comes in, Take your cue from what they're asking about. They're going to be asking about a lot of things. They're going to see a lot of things. Try, again, not to be sarcastic. Um, and that's because they don't understand irony. So at this one story of a mom saying to her kid, the kid says, can I have a play date with Jimmy? And mom says, jokingly, sure, I'll pencil it in in case the world's still here. And the kid's beside himself in my office, or well, actually on Zoom, wasn't in my office, um, because he takes that literally. So take your cue from what your child asks. And for older kids whose thinking is both logical and abstract, 
Um, what a great opportunity. And I think there are many opportunities, actually. What a great opportunity to teach teenagers, middle schoolers about critical thinking, where to get your information from, how do you know it's true. Um, let's research that together. So you talk to different ages, obviously somewhat differently. The most important thing by a long shot that you can do for your kids is maintain your own sanity through this period of time. And um, I think that's a big job. I think it is a big job and I'm not going to downplay it. You know, there's been a million things saying uh, self-care and uh, I'm talking to working women every day and self-care generally consists of going into the bathroom and screaming. Um, the, the con you can't go to Canyon Ranch, you can't get a massage, you can't. Self-care is breathing, meditation, healthy eating, some exercise, and a good night's sleep. If you can manage most of those, you're going to be in reasonably good shape. And you need to manage those for your children too. So, you know, in the beginning, all of all the psychologists were saying, you know, get a schedule and put it on your refrigerator. And yeah, a schedule is helpful in uncertain times. Um, but I was, I was constantly getting calls like, the schedule says nine o'clock, but I can't get my kid out of bed till 9.30. And, and my answer always was, uh, guess what? The new wake up time is 9.30. It is not worth constant conflict and constant fighting over, over small things. Your job when this ends and it will end slowly is to come out of it as a reasonably intact family. Um, and I think if you, and I don't think that's lowering the bar. I think that's having a realistic bar that's doable. Um, and it means tolerating more disagreement without making, without fighting about it. It's tolerating the dirty dishes versus the laundry. You know, there's a million things that go on over the course of a day. And older children absolutely should be recruited to be helpful. Um, one of the things that make us feel better in uncertain times is a sense of purpose. So you do get to say to your 15 year old, I have to work. I need you to take care of your eight year old sister for two hours or whatever. This is a family issue. This is not about individuality or your needs versus my needs. This won't work unless a family sort of pulls together and um, helps each other out because uncertainty does some really bad things to our brain. The toughest part about this, of course, is uncertainty. And why are we finding uncertainty so hard? I'm trying to, to plan a getaway with my kids and their spouses, and I'm a new grandma. Um, and I could not make a decision for a month. I absolutely could not make a decision on where I wanted us to go when this was over. And I'm pretty decisive, but our thinking is actually impaired. And why is it impaired? Because the job of the brain is prediction. That's your brain's job, right? You go to pick your kid up at school, um, you can predict what time school's over, where your child will come out of the school, what time they'll be ready to get in the car. Your brain is predicting all those things. Imagine if you didn't know what time school ended, or what exit your kid came, or even what school your child went to. It would be impossible. So the job of the brain is to predict, right? And that uses a lot of what we call executive functioning, a lot of the prefrontal cortex. The problem with uncertainty is it takes our prefrontal cortex offline and it goes, it, you know, the race to the bottom of the brain. It goes to our amygdala, which is about anxiety and aggression and, and feelings. And our, the reason I listed those things before, um, like meditation and breathing and eating well and exercise, is those, it's not just that, like, um, I want everybody to be healthy, although that's a good thing to be healthy, but it helps bring your prefrontal cortex back online. 
Um, and so this impossibility of making a decision for me kind of ended when I just went out and took a three hour walk and said, and started to feel better. So I want you to be aware that you're feeling badly because it's tough to be quarantined and you've got children at home and they don't know where they're going or, you know, graduation's over and they don't know where they're going to college. Um, so there's good reasons to be anxious, but I also feel, frankly, it, that uh, we have to have the perspective it's not the end of the world. It may feel like the end of the world to children, but our job is to give those children some perspective. And as lousy as it feels to them, uh, children have, you know, had to leave their homes, been slaughtered, been without food, been without medical care. This is difficult, but I think I'm, I talk to a lot of kids because teenagers tend to be having the hardest time. I don't want to stay in and, you know, their brain is telling them they have to be with their friends, not with you. And I think there are ways to set that up outdoors at a distance that meets some of those needs of teenagers, but it's, it's challenging and, um, and it's also not impossible and it also will win will win. That's interesting. Will end. Um, I think that there are four things that kids need, no matter what their age is. And those four things are, um, we call them the four S's. That's to be in an environment that is stable, secure, seen, and soothed. If you can keep, write those four things down and put them on your refrigerator along with your, your abandoned schedule. If you can provide that for children in this time, um, your children will emerge from this um, better uh, and healthier and have an opportunity to learn from this what they're capable of. Um, I have always felt we don't, we underestimate the capabilities of our children, not academically, but you know, I go to Israel and the 18 year olds are in charge of the country. Um, I think there's far more that we can expect from kids. Um, my kids had jobs every summer. Your kids should have jobs. Your kids should have chores. Your kids should feel that they are a part of this pandemic and that you help them by being calm, by giving them appropriate control, let them pick their own clothes or what time they go to bed. And if they're watching a little more screen time than you would like, so be it. Um, you got to model how to sit with uncertainty, which is challenging for everybody for the reasons I said. Um, I said before, it's an opportunity to teach media literacy for older kids, which I think is, I started my whole career with. Um, media literacy and two books that nobody ever read. Uh, but I think it's critically important. And, and I think the other thing I think is we don't tell our kids enough. Uh, you can get through this. Um, and that goes along with the protecting them from distress. Um, I think we need to say to our kids, you've got this. Um, and I don't think we do that enough. Um, it's like Carol Dweck has a great line when kids say, I can't do this, I can't manage it. And she always says, yet. Um, so it gives kids the idea that, you know, things take perseverance and work, et cetera. Um, and, and they will get to it. And I think telling our kids a little more frequently you've got this, or, um, you know, I'm here if you need me, but why don't you give it a shot, um, is, is a way of helping our kids feel more comfortable in this uncertainty. And, and it's, it's, I hope you don't feel that I've diminished this at all. I think it's incredibly complex, but I also think those are some reasonable tips for getting through it. And I see Lonnie has just written to me, um, and I, I, I feel like I did take my time, Lonnie. So if you and I want to chat, that would be cool. Lonnie? Yeah, hold on. <laughs> 
Hi there. Hi there. <laughs> Did I go over? I, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, terrible no, time. There's no such thing as over. We're making up every single rule with every program. <laughs> as we go. As we go. I got to tell, tell everybody how we met, Lonnie. Is that okay? And then you can go to your questions. Hold on, Madeline. I looked up that data point, and it is, um, our, I saw you, I met you for the first time on November 14th, 2007. Whoa, that's 13 years ago. 12 and a half years ago. Yeah, okay. So I, so I, I just want the audience to know, it's obvious Lonnie and I are old friends, um, but Lonnie was, and I, I'm thinking, I'm looking at the two of us on screen, Lonnie. We met when you were a baby and I was middle-aged. Now I'm old and you're kind of middle-aged, so it's been a while. <laughs> um, we met because I was giving a talk and there was this unusual woman in the audience right in the front Who's with that? purple hair. Um, and, you know, you couldn't help but notice her. She was made to be noticed. And towards the end of my talk, she asked a question. And I frankly don't remember what exactly the question was. However, it was so smart. And I just didn't feel like I gave her a good enough answer. So I called up whoever had arranged it, figuring a lady with purple hair would be easily identifiable, which she was. <laughs> and they put us in touch and we've been friends ever since. So that's a little background. Right? Yeah. It was fun. It was a it was a great night. I was like glad to get the last question. <laughs> it uh it spurred a whole bunch of stuff. So it's been great, Madeline. A very long time, twelve and a half years spent in relationship with you in a lot of different ways, not just with fan. Um, but it's been always, always a pleasure. I always like our late night dinners and right. get together. So I'm um, looking at the clock. We're at 7.42. So that's pretty, that's pretty darn good. We have about 18 minutes. Okay. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is a couple things. Um, we have um, uh, some questions that were submitted ahead of time. And I highlighted a couple of them that I thought you might be interested in answering. Um, there was a question. Let me see. There were, let me monitor for a quick second. Q&A. Um, Okay, uh, there is a question actually, and I, not to play, practice too much nepotism, but there are only a, a couple in the Q&A, and one of them is from my brother, Herm. He Herman, was, hi, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> he, was at, um, he was at a Robin D'Angelo event on Friday, and he was a little miffed that I didn't call him out there, so I'm gonna call him out now. So Herm okay. asked a question, he wanted to know, um, are the reason, are there some reasons why, why are schools teachers still not really giving out less homework? Because of course it feeds right into the issue of sleep loss, um, which of course has long been shown to be so detrimental to you know really anybody, but especially adolescents and young adults. So do you have any thoughts on why has the, unfortunately, why has the needle not moved on yeah. homework? So um, if, if I hold a meeting with um, the school administrators who for the most part really know um, the research, Harris Cooper's research on yeah. sleep and homework, um, they say it's the parents. If I talk to a group of parents, they say it's the administrators. So it goes back to that issue of um, I'm not willing to let my kid be an experiment. Everybody knows it's right, but you don't want to feel the expression I hear all the time, salmon swimming upstream. And you know, when, I, when I've been in Chicago and talked and there's a long line of people at the end, Lonnie, for book signing. And the line usually goes something like, you know, Dr. Levine, I really agree with you, but I'm the only one in the community. And I, how could I put my child to sleep differently? And then the woman after her comes up and says, you know, I'm the only person here who feels like that's really, really, you know, and th then I get a line and it's kind of like, why don't you go speak to each other? And I think, I think we've gotten so um, enmeshed in managing our kids' lives that, that women don't have, when my kids were younger, Lonnie, they sprayed chemicals on apples at the Safeway. We were all out protesting with signs, you know, don't poison our children. Um, I don't see that ever. And the issues are much bigger than, you know, apples. And yet 
the amount of time and energy that goes into micromanaging our children and not depending on other women um, to be in the same boat with us to make change, I think that's unfortunate. I would like to see that change. That's Sunia Luther's uh, work on how women really need other women to affect change and to feel supported. Mm -hmm. so. I'm wondering if you had that brought to mind when you were saying about change, because as you know, um, the rise in colleges and universities saying that SAT and ACT scores are not required um, or are optional now to submit them, and some of the imploding that's happening with the College Board, um, you know, they're, they're in a tight spot right now, um, yeah. to put it mildly. Um, I'm wondering if you have, um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think, um, of course, you know, it's funny because they say, well, even if the ACT and SAT, if they go by the wayside, it's not like um, universities won't figure out some kind of test. And what they'll do is they'll try to, uh, and, I'll, and I'll be benevolent, and I'll say that they're going to come up with a test that's a better test uh, to sort kids, right? Um, and I'm just kind of wondering both what you thought about that, but then also um, kind of in maybe along the, well, I'll, I'll stick it. I'll, let's stick with testing a little bit. Like, have, what do you think about that? Those, so the um, we know that SATs and uh, ACTs uh, predicted exactly one thing which was first semester grades in college and then nothing after that. Uh, alternately, three or four years of high school grades were predictive of completion of college. So I'm not sure that they'll come up with something new because whatever they come up with will be gamed. You know, it's, it's sort of like the question, um, tell us what your purpose is. And then all of a sudden everybody's taking care of their grandma and, and you know, foster children and it will be gamed because it's a one shot deal. I think if you look at ha the trajectory of a kid's performance over three or four years, you get a better um, sense of that kid. And, and again, I go back to this amazing experience, Lonnie, of talking to so many people who had, and it's not like I was looking for them. It's, they were just um, talking to successful people and half of them didn't finish college, half of them went back. I mean, it's the reality out in the world is that success depends on a whole bunch of um, factors and they can be learned in so many environments so at, cha at uh, one of our challenge success things we did like you did um, to, to gather data on various scenarios and one of the scenarios we used was a kid um, has gotten interested in his guitar and uh, but his math grades going down and we gave the audience i think three options would you take the guitar away? Would you get a tutor to help with his math grades? Or would you make the guitar contingent on his raising his grades? And um, I happened to be friends with James Hetfield, who's front man for Metallica. And I asked him what he thought about those two, those three options. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, what about the option of starting a band? <laughs> Right, I was going to say, where's option four? Yeah, where's option four, exactly. And, you know, not everybody is going to end up being a, a world famous, you know, rock and roll god, but that's not the point. The point is a kid can learn diligence, collaboration, perseverance, grit, all those things if they're interested in, profoundly interested. And I think we keep that narrow. You know, we say, well, photography is nice, but what are you going to do with it? Or um, I may have told you at some point, my favorite question to me is always, you know, my daughter's a talker and everybody comes to her when they have problems, like, what is she going to do with that? And it's like, oh, I don't know, maybe she'll be a psychologist. <laughs> so, you know, and, and last point on it, Lonnie, is take your kids' strengths. You know, I did not become... My spatial relations, you remember I once got lost going to the bathroom at Nutrier and you had to go find me? Terrible, terrible spatial relations. So I didn't become, my husband's a surgeon. I didn't become a surgeon. I went to my right, if you're a basketball fan, I went to my strength. And I think we cult, should cultivate our kids' strengths, their, their weaknesses is, as long as they're trying. That, yeah, that's how everybody is. We have strengths and weaknesses. 
that reminds me of very early in my career with Fan. We hosted David Elkind, um, you know, the brilliant David Elkind. Yeah, yeah. He was and, the um, grandfather. Yeah, yeah, I love I love that man very much. Um, and his name is spelled E L K I. Excuse me. Kai. Yeah, Kai. E L K I N D. David Elkin. Just a, a genius. Um, the hurry child. Love him very much. Um, yes, and he he said very poignantly from the podium. He said, "Do your very best to love the child uh, that is in front of you, not the child that you wish you had." Mm -hmm. um, and so it's this thing of the acceptance, uh, the the uh, full acceptance, which can be hard, the full acceptance that your DNA with you and whomever has produced this child, um, but this child is not a, um, a blend or some kind of amalgam of the two people who came together with sperm and egg to produce this child. This child is, a, is an independent soul, an independent human being who will have likes and dislikes and preferences that will not be shared perhaps by either parent. And to um, keep that in mind always, especially as they get older and you discover more and more like, well, where did this creature come from? We actually have a third roommate. Who is this person? You know, and that, that's a good thing, right? Um, let me get to some questions here and let's-, Wait, let's I, just, I just want to say something about that idea of it's not cumulative when you put two people together. It used yeah. to be, I got asked a lot, people would say, you know, my kid's a mediocre student and she's so smart and my wife's so smart and I'm so smart. And it's like, you know, IQ is not cumulative. It's not if you oh. have 130 and you have 130, your kid's going to be 260. It just doesn't work like that. And, and I think that's a big task, Lonnie, to honor and respect and get pleasure out of the things that your kid brings that's, that are different. Of course. Um, I'm going to make a note to our two back end producers, if you guys could capture that Q&A um, because I want to just make sure that we have the questions. So let's let's go to a couple of these questions. We have Julie says, um, do you think students who have been affected by COVID will be behind academically in the future? Of course, that might, you're not a teacher, but you might have a, a ballpark answer there. Um, that, that question depends on your time frame. Um, will they be behind tomorrow? Yeah. Um, will they be behind in a few months? Probably. Um, will they be behind in a couple of years? Uh, nobody knows. I mean, that in a way, that question is a reflection of the kind of anxiety. You know, I could spout out anything. We simply don't know. Um, and there, there are no best practices right now because nobody has practices. So okay. we can't get best practices. All right, we're doing rapid fire here, Madeline. Okay. Right, we have Barbara, what about kids staying up with social media late at night? I or nay. <laughs> How late? And are they getting no, up and doing it? Let's yeah. just say late. And maybe she said kids, not teens. Maybe we'll assume that they're not 16, 17. Let's assume maybe middle school, maybe, and early yeah. high school. We're, 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 you're, we're just making that up. But look, yeah. every family's different. Every, every kid is different. There are kids who are just fine uh, staying up, not all night long. But, you know, you give them an extra hour and they're not doing anything that's unhealthy, who cares? Um, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, but I think I, I spoke to a kid today who's absolutely panicked by what she's seeing in the media. I'm more concerned about what kids see in the media, the shootings, the deaths, um, than I probably am right now about video games. So, you yeah. know, you need some rules around it, obviously. You just have to be a little more flexible. All right, another question from uh, Laura, Laura, Laura. I can't quite read the writing. Um, how do you move the EQ needle, emotional, I probably EQ, emotional intelligence, probably, uh, needle with high schoolers? Um, so you, you catch, I, I think this is true for all kids, you catch kids being good, right? We catch them being bad all the time, but you catch them being, oh, I, I see you really got how grandma was feeling, or I have seen, you know, what we pay attention to really determines the level of success our kids are gonna have with that particular skill. So all these things, creativity and curiosity, and people say you can't train or emotional intelligence, you can't train for any of that. We have great research that says you can uh, train for it and it has to do with what you pay attention to and what you reinforce in your kid. Okay, from Allison, how do you address anxiety in a child who displays it but doesn't realize he has anxiety? 
He also doesn't ask questions about the pandemic or other concerns. Uh, did you say age in that? Uh, there is no age, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, child, a child so that, that would imply not a teen. Um, I don't know, I still call my 30 year old children, so hard, hard to know. I have, yeah. My oldest is 40, I still call him my, my child. Um, so he doesn't know he's anxious. I would, I think kids know when they're anxious. Being anxious is very uncomfortable. Um, it means you're, you're repetitively thinking about things. You're not really free. Your mind is preoccupied with bad outcomes and stuff like that. So um, the question is how, how to get him to be more aware. If, it, if in fact it's a young child, you label emotions for them. Uh, so if he's antsy and <clears throat> not able to come out of some repetitive thinking, you say, you know, it looks like you're a little anxious. What do you think? Um, often kids do, just don't have words for the emotions that they have. All right, I'm gonna give you two more questions. Uh, okay. Question one. <clears throat> <clears throat> How do you know when to worry about your kid's mental health or your own? At what point is it just, this is okay versus I think I need to consult with someone? What to you are the markers of that? So um, it's intensity and, and length of time. So to be diagnosed with anything is a couple of weeks. You know, if you have a bad day or your kid has a bad day or two or three, um, probably not worried yet. You wanna see how that plays out. If you have a kid who can't get out of bed for two weeks, you need a consultation. So we usually use two weeks of symptoms where the person is impaired. And look, you know, call your pediatrician. If you're not sure about your kid, your pediatrician has seen a thousand kids and you've seen your two or one or three. Um, and, and that's a good first uh, level of checking in um, and then whether or not it needs a mental health consultation. Okay, and then I think a last question is that I'd like to, um, you know, look at it from a little bit of, for you, where are you seeing the spots of hope? What are, what are the things that give you the re, um, refuel your optimism in either basic human goodness or that we're not all going to go to hell in a hand bucket, that this, this is, um, where, where are you finding the pieces that are kind of reinforcing an essential optimism? Well, I'm essentially a pessimist, so you need to know that. <laughs> I am. I, I so, <laughs> so optimism is challenging for me. I, I think what I see is, are a lot of opportunities here. I really do. I think it's incredibly difficult. But in my own life, I mean, that's in some ways a personal question. In my own life, um, you know, Lani, I've been running around this country. I've spoken at 300 or 400 schools. I don't even remember anymore. Um, on an airplane every other week. I am not doing that again. I have rediscovered some of the, I, and I will do some of it, but not every week. Um, and I think a lot of people are finding that I'm working as hard, but I'm not as pressured. I don't have flights to make and cars to make. And so I think a lot of people are re-examining values and purpose. Like, what am, I, what am I here for? And um, the opportunity to see children playing out on the street in Pacific Heights, I never saw that. And they're out there with chalks and bicycles and laughing. I think there are a lot of opportunities to read this achievement. Okay, Madeline, thank you so much for your time from out in California. Thank you to all of the attendees who stuck in with us. Uh, we appreciate it as you help us uh, see our learning curve on how to do all of this and for your patience and forgiveness when we screw up a little bit. Um, thanks for um, everyone. Thanks for your participation. Uh, we're really excited to see what the future will bring. So I'm going to mute myself and we... But you are... And now I'm... And my mute, it says I am muted, unmuted, muted, unmuted, unmuted or unmuted. Anyway, thanks everyone. Um, have a good night. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs>